Hello everyone, uh, my name is Wesley, this is Wu Can Cook. Uh, today we're doing a ch uh, Shanghai meatball dish called Lion's Head Meatball or Shi Zi Tou. Uh, it comes as I just mentioned from Shanghai news. Uh, but you will generally see it in most Chinese, actually not most, but a lot of Chinese restaurants. I feel like it, most, most Chinese restaurants that you see in the States uh, just generally like pan-Asian cuisine or like pan-Chinese cuisine at the very least. So. Uh, you, you will very, very often see it come up in a lot of ch Chinese cuisine, especially like uh, like uh, comfort food Chinese cuisine. This particular dish that we're cooking today uh, is inspired by a version of lion's head meatball that you used to be able to find at a restaurant in San Francisco called Dragon House. Uh, that restaurant is no longer there, actually, uh, but I used to go there when I was a kid. Uh, so the version that we're cooking today is a recipe that I wrote that's loosely inspired by that particular version. Uh, that version, it did contain a, one ingredient that I did not choose to include, which is a little bit of spinach, which I left out because I don't like spinach that much. Uh, and I remember when I was a kid, that was the part that I hated the most, which is totally fine. Uh, so in lieu of that spinach, what we're going to be using today instead is some baby bok choy, which I think is going to work out really well. Um, uh, the main reason that we're not using spinach today, though, is because I just don't like doing this dish with spinach in it. So if you want to use spinach, you can absolutely use spinach. It would be pretty uh, pretty common. Uh, but otherwise, the main thing that uh, we're going to be using today, uh, in other than the ground pork, which we're going to be taking this look at in a second, uh, is mainly going to be the use of dark soy sauce. So that's kind of like one of the big elements that stands out to me when I think about a lion's head meatball, is that use of dark soy sauce. Uh, and the way that it, the meatballs are going to be braised in and wok fry. So that's kind of like one of the big outstanding things that kind of poke out to me when I do this particular dish. So uh, if you have any questions for me, feel free and drop those questions in the chat. I don't know uh, everything about Lion's Head Meatball, but I know lots of stuff, so hopefully I can be helpful or informative. Very least fun to watch. <coughs> Starting things off, what we're going to do today is our garlic and ginger, but for, uh, it's not, we don't do this all the time, but in this particular case, what we're going to do uh, is separate these in half. And what I'm going to do is use half of them in our meatball proper. Uh, and then the other half is going to go straight into our stir fry. So half of them are going to be used as like the kind of like really traditional way that we usually use aromatic. They just go straight into the stir fry. Uh, but the other half is going to go straight into our meatballs, and that's going to give our meatballs that kind of uh, aromatic la flavor layers of umami that we're looking for, uh, since they're sort of like worked into the meatball itself. So, uh, so I'm starting off. This is that was four cloves of garlic that we just finished chopping. Actually, I think it was three cloves of garlic, uh, but one of the cloves was very large. Uh, and then this is this uh, next is about an inch or about one tablespoon's worth of ginger. Uh, and then we're going to throw this in two different places. So. Uh, 
Uh, that's our garlic and ginger. Uh, and then I actually don't know why I just put it in that bowl. Uh, what we're going to do next is get, I'm going get to get out one of my largest mi mixing bowls. Uh, and then what we're going to do is throw all of this straight into our mixing bowl. And that's going to be uh, what, where we start building out our meatballs. So, uh, let's see. Uh, before we get on to that though, next up I'm going to start with our veggies. So as I mentioned earlier, in lieu of the spinach that is more traditionally found in this particular dish. Uh, today we're going to be working with some baby bok choy, which as the name is like a very very small piece of bok choy so uh, if you're more familiar with like full-grown bok choy it's like gonna be about this big uh, it's almost like twice the size of one of these uh, and uh, they are somewhat similar in flavor uh, but probably the most outstanding thing about baby bok choy that I identify at least uh, is that because they are picked earlier so they're a little bit younger uh, they have a little bit less uh, bite to it so as the bok choy ripens and like grows into full maturity uh, it turns a little bit more bitter, so it kind of falls in line with the general like color that you're looking at too. Um, so if you've ever had bok choy and it was like a little bit um, tough to bite into, uh, that's coming from the fact that it is a full-grown bok choy. It can also sometimes be a little bit chewy too. Uh, so uh, from my childhood, what I always identify with that is the, uh, the memory of choking down bok choy a lot. Uh, and just sort of like washing it down with water and kind of holding my breath while I do it. Uh, so I personally, I have a strong distaste for full-grown bok choy. Uh, so I usually <laughs> uh, go in favor of the baby bok choy that we're using today. Um, but if you like that stuff, you can absolutely do it too. Uh, but almost uh, any time that you see me working with bok choy, uh, we're probably going to be working with baby bok choy like we are today for that particular reason. Uh, since the baby bok choy is so small, we don't need to do too much to it. I'm slicing these into quarters because these are actually relatively large bok choy. Um, but after that, we don't need to do much else. Uh, really, the size, the small size of the bok choy is doing most of the work for us. Uh, main thing that we want to do, especially if you're working with like uh, Chinatown bok choy, uh, give that stuff a wash because it is really, really dirty, just like any other leafy green. Uh, or if you've ever like worked with lettuce, for example, you'll very, very often you will find like bugs floating around in it because it's coming straight off of the farm. Uh, so you want to make sure and give that stuff a good, good watch, uh, especially in these leaves right here that can get really, really dirty. Uh, but just like any time that we wash vegetables for a wok fry, uh, we also want to be very careful to shake out as much of this water that gets left behind too. So all of this stuff uh, that's sort of getting trapped in those leaves, we want to shake that water out. Uh, because if you don't shake it out, when you do put this into the wok, for what's going to go into the wok uh, is all of that liquid. That liquid is going to get into the wok too, and that's going to do a combination of things. Uh, but the main, the main two things, the first thing that it's going to do is it's going to start sputtering really, really aggressively. Uh, and that's how you get oil burns, which is not super fun. Uh, and then the second thing that it's going to do is it's going to dramatically change the temperature of your wok. So it's going to cause the whole wok uh, to become much, much cooler and like not quite uh, as hot as you need it to be in order to have like uh, flash cooked wok fried veggies. So if we're, at any time that we're working with veggies in a wok, uh, we want to try and hold off and as much of that water as we possibly can. All right. Uh, next up, this is some water chestnuts. So if you can't find water chestnuts, I've actually found that water chestnuts are relatively easy to locate. Uh, but if you can't find, get your hands on water chestnuts like this, they come in cans. So uh, they're relatively easy to locate. At least here in California, I found this little old sprouts. This was not in a Chinatown. Uh, and they'll be canned like this. Uh, and I, I love using water chestnuts in a meatball like this. Uh, not because it has a particular flavor. I find that water chestnuts, they don't taste much at all. Um, kind of reminds me of hikima, which someone mentioned on stream. Uh, in that it doesn't really have much flavor to it, but it has a very, very distinct crunch to it. So uh, if we use them in a meatball like we are going to be using them today, uh, then you can add this really interesting like texture and uh, like layer of like crunch that is going to come into the meatball uh, without really impacting the way that it tastes. So that's really, really useful uh, in a lion's head meatball because it's going to give us an extra bit of like crunch to it. Uh, so what I want to do, uh, these are already pre-cut into slices. 
uh, is what we're going for is something closer to the general shape and size of our ground meat. So I'm going to do uh, is give it a rough chop. Uh, and then I might actually go for a fine, or like a very, very loose mince. Um, and basically what I'm going for here is I'm not going to be particularly uh, detail-oriented about making sure that my uh, fine mint is particularly even or like even out like we were doing with the ginger. Uh, what I'm really going for here is uh, large and irregular shapes and that's going to give us this really interesting and like surprising bits of crunch that come in different shapes and sizes and that's not going to um, cause any like problems with the way that it cooks. Make sure that it cooks evenly because it's in a big old meatball so it's going to be flipped into the meatball anyway. So those are, I guess you could call that like a slice and then what we're going to do is run our knife through it. Uh, but I'm not going to be particularly careful about the way that uh, we fine mince this. We definitely don't want to pulverize this in the way that we would do it with like ginger uh, because if it becomes pulverized then we're going to lose all of that texture. So uh, I'm not going to be super careful. We're going to stop right around there. Uh, and you'll notice that there are some large bits like this. Uh, where are there also going to be some small bits like so. And we have this uh, very wide array of like, shapes and sizes to our water chestnuts. Very useful. Okay, so next up I'm going to start working in our meatballs here. So here is the mixing bowl that we've been tossing things into. Uh, we're just going to start putting a whole bunch of stuff into here and then it's going to start looking very similar to pretty much any other meatball that you've ever made. Uh, so pretty similar to an Italian meatball or a Swedish meatball. It actually reminds me more of a Swedish meatball because I have a thickening agent in it. Um, in a really, really traditional uh, lion's head meatball, it would not have anything other than cornstarch. So today what we're going to be using uh, is a little bit of panko breadcrumb, which I actually find uh, is very useful in getting like a more like thicker uh, and like dense chew to our meatball. Uh, but if you want, you can absolutely leave it out. My dad swears uh, that you should not use panko breadcrumb. Uh, especially if you're trying to keep it gluten free, you can absolutely do this with just cornstarch and that will work too. Uh, but I, I swear by it, I personally find that it adds uh, a little bit more denseness kind of like helps hold the whole meat together a little bit better. So that's half a cup of panko breadcrumb going into our mixing bowl. Uh, then next up we're finally going to get to our ground meat. So this today we are using ground pork which is definitely the most traditional thing that you can put into a lion's head meatball. Uh, generally, uh, when you see it come up in most restaurants, it's probably made with some kind of ground pork. It might be made with minced pork. Uh, I made it with minced pork, actually, and it worked out really great. Uh, I've also made it with many, many different kinds of ground meat. So I've done it with ground turkey. I've also done it with uh, ground beef. Uh, I think I've done it with, like, lamb at one point. <laughs> Uh, whatever it ha you happen to have on hand, it will probably work out okay. Uh, what's more important is not actually the type of meat, but what it, the what's more important is the fat content of this meat. Uh, so what we have here uh, is some ground pork that is very, very high in fat content. Uh, so that's going to be uh, really, really useful because it's going to help us get uh, all of that sear. You have to have that fat content in order to properly sear these meatballs. Without it, uh, you're going to have a that meatball to sear otherwise uh, it's going to probably end up burning instead of searing because there's not enough fat content into it so I have also done this meatball dish uh, with very very lean ground, pork, uh, ground beef and it did not work out we ended up burning those meatballs so don't want that uh, next up this is four tablespoons of soy sauce going in uh, followed by two tablespoons of sesame oil. Uh, 
Uh, and then that's actually going to be it for the liquid elements in our meatball. So we are very intentionally going pretty easy on those liquid elements. Uh, and at least in the meatball itself, because if we add too much liquid to this meatball, uh, it's going to start having trouble holding together. So we're trying to reduce as much moisture in this meatball as possible. Uh, because when it gets into the fry, it's already going to start shedding quite a bit of fat out already. So uh, we want to hold off on that liquid as much as possible. So next up, this is going to be half a teaspoon of white pepper. Uh, followed by half a teaspoon of Chinese rice spice. So if you've never, uh, probably the most outstanding. Uh, well, it, it, so it is a spice blend, as the name implies. Uh, but the spices that are in Chinese rice spice, I've discovered this recently, actually. Uh, is that the spices that are in Chinese five spice can vary very, very widely depending on uh, what what brand of Chinese five spice that you buy. Uh, the ones that are probably most iconically found in five spice are cinnamon, uh, star anise, and I believe cumin is probably the three, uh, the big three. Uh, sometimes you might find uh, Szechuan peppercorn in there. Al al almost always you also find MSG worked into Chinese five spice. Um, but super often I've discovered that it can vary pretty widely. So I'm going to work my meatballs in together. Um, really what we're trying to do is just combine all of that panko breadcrumb so that we have a nice cohesive meatball. And then I think we're done chopping actually. Then what we're gonna do is, so this is also super important, uh, and I have definitely on many occasions tried to eyeball my lion's head meatballs and have it go poorly. Uh, it is actually super, super important to make sure that the sizes of your meatballs are very, very even. Uh, otherwise, if you're not careful, if you have a meatball that's much smaller than the other meatballs, uh, what you'll end up with is a meatball that is slightly burnt because it is cooking faster. So if we're trying to make sure that our meatballs cook uh, at an even rate, uh, we have to make sure that they all weigh very, very similar proportions. So if we're careful, uh, what we should end up with are eight evenly sized meatballs, uh, all equaling, I hope, 2.8 ounces. I think that's what I wrote down, so we'll find out. Uh, so I'm uh, using the scale here and then I'm tearing it each time. Uh, tearing is essentially just clearing it. Uh, and we're trying to make sure that our meatballs are all the same size. Uh, very, very often, I actually don't know that I have ever made lion's head meatball uh, and gotten them all the same size. We'll find out. Usually the last one is too small. Let's find out. Cool. Hello to everyone just tuning in. My name is Wesley. This is Wu Can Cook. Uh, if this is your first time tuning in, we're here every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday at 6.30 PST uh, with new recipes out over on my YouTube channel every Friday. So uh, if this is your first time catching one of these, uh, we're uh, releasing new recipes out every Friday on the YouTube channel. So last Friday uh, was a recipe for... What did we do last Friday? Uh, to make beef chow mein, which is my mom's favorite type of chow mein. I think because it has so much vegetables in it. Uh, this particular dish that we're cooking today is a Shanghainese lion's head meatball, which is a pork meatball. Uh, that's roughly the size and shape of it, almost, this, almost as large as a tennis ball. It's a pretty large meatball. Uh, and then what we're gonna do, we're gonna sear it in a wok and then braise it for quite a while in a dark soy sauce braise. Uh, and that's gonna give us this very, very deep and savory umami flavor to our meatball. Uh, if you have any questions for me, feel free and drop your questions in the chat. I don't know everything about lion's head meatball, but uh, I know lots of stuff, so hopefully I can be helpful or informative or fun to watch at the very least. Uh, as with pretty much everything that we cook, this particular lion's head meatball has a recipe that goes along with it. It already lives over on my YouTube channel. Uh, we did this recipe. I think this one came out... Uh, oh, I forget. I think it came out like back in like December or so. It was quite a while ago. 
Uh, so if you're looking for that stuff, it already lives over there. Uh, those recipes, they tend to move a little bit slower, so if you're trying to reproduce the things that we're cooking, uh, that's a good place to start. Ooh. Uh, what else? Uh, yeah, oh, in addition to all of the recipe videos, that's also where all of the live stream schedule lives too. I'm trying to figure out uh, what I'm going to be streaming next. That's a good place to start because that holds the uh, concurrent live stream. It lives over on YouTube. Uh, and that YouTube channel, I think it goes out like oh, three weeks, maybe a little bit more than that. Uh, so if you want to know what we're going to be cooking next, that's a good place to start. And with that, we're almost completely equal. So. <laughs> Uh, so I mentioned this earlier, but I'll say it again. Uh, very, very important when you're doing something like a lion's head meatball to make sure that your meatballs are all in the same size. So if you have one meatball uh, that's much smaller than the rest of the meatballs, which happens to me all of the time, uh, then that one meatball that's much smaller is going to cook much, much faster than the rest of the meatballs. So uh, if you ever end up with a burnt meatball, that's how it happens it's because the meatballs are not the same shape and size. So uh, I. I did get a scale out to make sure that our meatballs are all the same shape and size and that was very intentional because uh, it is really, really important. You don't want a meatball that's the wrong size uh, because it will 100% start burning and will overcook if you're not careful. Not fun. Uh, so over on my stove, I've got my wok heating up. I just started the fire. It probably will take about a minute and change uh, to start getting ripping hot. Anytime that we're cooking in a wok, I mention this pretty much every stream now, uh, but every time that we're cooking in a wok, we want to make sure that that wok is extremely hot before we start cooking in it. We basically need it to be uh, about as hot as a as hot, about as hot as your home range will let it get. So uh, the reason for that is uh, we never want to be cooking on medium or medium low that's how you end up with mushy stir fries. So lots of folks ask me like, where, where do I set the temperature? Uh, like what temperature am I cooking at in the wok? Uh, and generally, unless we're like long cooking or like braising something, which we might do later, um, it's almost always just going to be hot. It's just hot all the time. Uh, and that's because you're never gonna have quite enough heat in the wok fry. Uh, so unless I'm cooking on a wok burner, which I have been doing lately, uh, I almost never really uh, have to change the temperature of the fire because the fire is basically just gonna be hot the whole time. So uh, the reason that it needs to be hot the entire time is because everything that it happens in a wok has to be cooked for a very, very short amount of time uh, at a very, very high heat. And that's how you get really like crispy flash fried veggies or crispy flash fried meats or like flash fried chicken, all of these things uh, that are like, uh, like very, very smoky and like cooked very, very quickly. Uh, that's because it's happening on extremely high heat. So uh, before we start cooking it in our wok, we want to make sure that that thing is extremely hot before you start cooking in it. Uh, the other thing that we're going to be doing today that is also super important is the uh, concept of batch cooking. Because batch cooking essentially means uh, that we're going to be cooking our first element and then removing it and then adding our next element and then cooking that uh, while the wok is still empty. So the goal here, uh, anytime that we're cooking in a wok on a home range, hey, this ham charo, it's ham charo. He eats ramen every time someone subscribes. Please subscribe. Uh, the, the reason that we need to batch cook is because as you add more things to your wok, uh, that wok is going to start filling up. And once it starts filling up, the temperature of the wok is going to start uh, dropping quite a bit. And so the more stuff that's in it, the lower the temperature starts getting. So in order to regulate and make sure that our wok stays hot for the entire time that we're cooking things, we want to try and make sure that there's not too much stuff in it at any point. Otherwise, we're going to start cooking like oatmeal basically which is not fun you'll just microwave this yeah you could probably do it it would probably be pretty pretty uh pretty chewy but you could totally do it though yeah all right Uh, so over on my stove, we've got our wok heating up. This is probably pretty hot at this point. I'm going to add this is about four tablespoons of peanut oil. Uh, and then anytime that we're cooking in a, a wok, we want to do our long yao, which is essentially coating that wok in that cold oil. Uh, and that's going to create our non-stick surface. It's very, very important. Uh, otherwise, your meatballs are going to stick. Not fun. Uh, and then I'm adding my meatballs about, I'm going to do four at a time. 
Uh, and obviously, as you probably will notice, that the wok is large enough to fit all eight of them in the wok at once. Uh, we don't want to just throw everything into the wok at once. We don't want to do all eight uh, at the same time, because what will happen uh, is if we were to add all eight of those into the wok, uh, it would not stay hot enough, and we would eventually end up with uh, probably like undercooked, either undercooked meatballs uh, or overcooked and like burnt meatballs, depending on how long we le leave it in. So, uh, in order to make sure that those things keep uh, and like cook thorough all the way through, uh, we have to leave it in uh, and cook it in batches. Very important. Uh, so, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna sear our meatballs. So, I'm gonna leave it. Uh, and let it sit for, I wrote this down, a minute and a half per side. So uh, that will probably need another about a minute. Uh, and what we're trying to do, and this is true for any time that you're searing something, uh, is the key to getting a crispy sear, uh, and this is true for pretty much anything that you're searing, is that you gotta stop moving. Uh, in order for it to sear, it has to not be agitated, which is really, really concerning, uh, because you're gonna start wondering like, whether or not the thing that you're searing is burning, which Essentially, it is that that is what it's doing. Basically, what a sear is is a controlled burn. So, uh, try not to try not to freak out. It is burning, but it's not burning. It's burning in a pleasant way. Yeah. Uh, so we're at 40 seconds. I'm going to start moving this in 10 seconds. Let this go for another second. There we go. Uh, so I'm gonna give those a flip, then we're gonna try and get the same level of browning on the all sides of our meatball. Now, uh, that will never happen. Uh, if anyone who has ever made a pancake will tell you is that the second side never browns quite as well as the first side. Uh, I have a few theories as to why that happens, but my main guess is just uh, magic of how proteins work. <laughs> uh, so don't worry if you can't quite get the same level of browning, it's not the end of the world. Uh, but we're going to try and get it as crispy as possible on all sides. So, uh, If you want, uh, and if you're not familiar with working with ground pork, uh, you can also get a meat thermometer out and start checking the internal temperatures of your meatball at this point. We're looking for 165F on the inside. Uh, if you're not sure, that's always a good thing to do because uh, meat, uh, ground pork, unlike ground beef, uh, can absolutely give you food poisoning if it's un undercooked. So we want to make sure that these meatballs are cooked all the way through, otherwise uh, you can absolutely get sick from these. Uh, I personally have baked these meatballs so many times that I have stopped checking the internal temperatures uh, and really just like to eyeball it at this point. But if you're not sure, uh, that's always a smart thing to start doing. Hello to everyone just tuning in. My name is Wesley. This is Wu Can Cook. Uh, if this is your first time tuning in, we're here every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday at 6.30 PST uh, with new recipes out over on my YouTube channel every Friday. So last Friday, uh, we did a recipe for a tomato beef chow mein, which was one of my mom's favorite chow mein's when I was growing up. Uh, it's also part of a larger series where we've been kind of reproducing a lot of Chinese takeouts that are featured in TV and film. Uh, that particular one is based off of a scene from Will and Grace, which is super fun. Uh, so if you're interested in stuff like that, I definitely recommend hopping over to the YouTube channel and checking out what's going on over there. Uh, we're working our way to 4,500 subs by the end of the month, so if you want to help us hit our subscriber goal, uh, please hop over and subscribe. Lots of fun new content coming up every week. Samantha, hey, how's it going? Hello. Hello to everyone over on YouTube. Uh, as as you may have guessed, in addition to where all of the recipes live, that's also where the concurrent live stream lives. So you see behind me, uh, there's another laptop ticking away. That laptop, it goes to YouTube. Uh, and on that live stream, there's also a whole schedule of everything that we're going to be cooking for the next, uh, I think, like three weeks and change. So if you want to find out what we're doing next, there's all of the whole schedule of all of the releases, uh, plus the schedule of all of the live streams that lives over there.
So I'm just giving my meatballs a good rotation to make sure that we get good, even solid browning going on on all sides. Uh, at this point, it is also super useful if you have a round bottom wok to use a round bottom wok. Uh, you'll notice that all of the oil in our wok, in addition to all of that pork fat, uh, it's pulling up right at the bottom where the bottom of the wok kind of meets and rounds off. So that's very, very useful uh, because you don't have to use quite as much oil so you can kind of save some of that oil uh, just by using a round bottom wok. So I'll mention this again. If you're not sure, you can get a meat thermometer out at this point and start checking internal temperatures. Uh, we're looking for 165 F inside. Uh, I honestly have stopped checking internal temps on these meatballs because I cook them so often. But if you're not sure, that's always a smart thing to do because uh, unlike with ground beef, so with ground beef, you can absolutely undercook ground beef. That's essentially what a rare hamburger is or also a rare steak is. Uh, but with ground pork, we don't want ground pork. Undercooked ground pork will absolutely give you food poisoning. So uh, be smart. If you're not sure, check that temperature. All right, so I'm pulling my first batch of meatballs out, and then we're going to uh, coat that wok a little bit more, and we're going to add our second batch going in. So just like with our first batch, we're going to add all of our meatballs close to the center of the wok as possible, uh, because that's where all of the oil is. So that's, again, another super important aspect to how a sear works uh, is that it has to be making contact with that oil. So if you put something into a wok uh, and there isn't enough oil in it while you're trying to sear, what will happen is it's just going to start burning. So it's that oil and it's very, very important. Uh, for the same reason, that fat is also very, very important. So the reason that we're using today a very, very fat heavy uh, ground pork is because it's going to render out in the wok fry and that's going to be where all of the searing comes from. So just like with our first batch, we're going to let this go for a full minute and a half undisturbed. That's how we're going to develop that sear. Uh, some of you might start wondering whether or not your meatballs are burning. Actually, it might be burning, but that's essentially what we're going for is remember that a sear is a controlled burn. Real quick, we can take a look at our finished meatballs here. So here is our done meatballs. Uh, we have this nice deep browning here, so all of this uh, is what we're looking for here. So this very, very dark caramelization. Uh, that's very, very important. Uh, it's coming from all of that searing that we're doing uh, and just generally happening from the fact that we're leaving it undisturbed for a minute and a half. Uh, that sear is also going to be really, really important as we get into our braise because it's going to be how the meatballs hold together uh, as you start braising. Super, super important. All right, we're at a minute and a half. I'm going to flip these over. Uh, it is also worth mentioning that while the meatballs are raw, they're much more delicate than once they're fully cooked. So if you've ever broken a meatball in a wok fry, uh, it is the worst possible thing that can happen. So you want to, while they're raw and still cooking, uh, be very, very gentle with how you flip them over because you can absolutely break them open. Uh, and then you're going to have a real bad time. You're going to have broken meatballs flying everywhere. Not fun. Cool, let's start taking a look.
Uh, and then once they start searing, then it's going to start holding together a lot better so it won't be nearly as delicate as it was uh, when we first started out with a raw meatball. So you can start being a little bit more aggressive with your tossing. Uh, but for the duration of time where you're still working with uh, a raw meatball, we want to be very, very careful with that stuff. Else, uh, You can absolutely burn one of those or break it open. Cool. So just like with our first batch, I'm looking for even browning across the entire meatball. So uh, what I like to do is just flip it on its side. That tends to help. Uh, it also tends to help to have this round bottom walk because we can sort of just stack everything together. So very, very useful. If you've ever tried to sear a meatball, you'll notice because obviously it's a round meatball. Uh, is it's going to have a lot of trouble standing on its side because it's going to start rolling around and then you're going to have this issue where you're not going to be able to keep even browning on the sides of it uh, because it won't want to stay there so you're going to have thing, that thing rolling around. So super useful especially in a round bottom walk like we have today uh, as you are able to stack it next to each other and hold those things up. This one of these is about to break. Yeah. Steve, how's it going? Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Cool. Hello to everyone just tuning in. My name is Wesley. This is Wu Can Cook. Uh, if this is your first time tuning in to one of these streams, we're here every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday uh, at 6.30 PST with new recipes out every Friday. So today we're doing a lion's head meatball in the toe. Uh, which is a recipe that came out over on the channel. I want to say that was back in December or January. I think it was, I think it was in the winter. Uh, so if you're looking for those recipes, that's a good place to start. They all live over there in recipe form already. Uh, in addition to that, that's also where the concurrent live stream lives. So uh, I have been announcing all of these streams and what we're going to be cooking over on YouTube. Uh, I think like they go out about three weeks. So if you want, you can check out what's coming up. Uh, and those, those, uh, that. Uh, list of things that we're going to be streaming also has an ingredient list and links to the recipes. So if you want, you can pick up the ingredients yourself uh, and cook along with me. It's always super fun. Ooh, one of these is going to break. I know it already. All right. That ought to do it. So normally what I always advocate for is making sure to remove what's in the wok before you move on to your next uh, ingredient because it contains a lot of stuff that is just going to start burning. Uh, lately I've been experimenting with working with the fond that remains in a wok fry so I generally don't recommend doing that uh, because in a wok fond usually will end up burning but lately it's been working out so I'm going to try and use this. So. We have in our wok all of this reserve uh, pork fat, which is going to be very, very tasty. Uh, so ideally, I'd like to not uh, remove it. Hey, there's Ham Charo. Thanks, th thanks for subscribing, Tyler. Uh, going in first, this is my garlic and ginger. Uh, and then I'm going to let that bloom for about 10 seconds. What we're really looking for at this point is for that garlic and ginger to start becoming fragrant. Uh, so use your nose at this point when you start smelling garlic and ginger. Uh, we'll be ready to move on. Alright. There's my bok choy. I forgot to do the sauce. So turn that burner off. We'll do our sauce real quick. Uh, real quick, we're gonna start doing our sauce because I forgot to do it before we started cooking. It's not gonna be the end of the world. That bok choy might burn a little. 
So this is gonna be, this is four tablespoons of soy sauce. Let's start. Uh, followed by a single tablespoon of sesame oil. Two tablespoons of Shaoxing wine, which is a type of Chinese cooking wine. If you can't find Chinese Shaoxing wine, you can also just use dry cooking sherry. Uh, I have discovered that dry cooking sherry, it actually might taste better than uh, Shaoxing wine because Shaoxing wine, generally when you find it, is a really, really low quality uh, type of wine. So. Uh, and super often we'll have some kind of additive in it. So I usually end up just going to Chaoxing one because I can find it at the market for super cheap. But uh, if you're not sure, or if you can find dry cooking sherry somewhere else, it's probably going to be even better. Uh, next up, that is a single one tablespoon. Yeah, a single tablespoon of dark soy sauce. Followed by, this is going to be the one thing that doesn't really belong in here. This is two tablespoons of sweet chili sauce. Uh, I like using sweet chili sauce in this particular dish because it kind of gives us a little bit of extra sweetness and kind of adds an interesting aspect to our uh, flavor palette. Uh, but if you don't like sweet stuff, you can probably leave that stuff out. Uh, and then, very last up, this is going to be three whole tablespoons of Lao Gan Ma, or spicy chili crisp. Uh, if you've never had Lao Gan Ma, it is essentially uh, red chili flakes uh, that are fermented and bloomed in oil. And it kind of gives us this like very, very oily form of heat uh, that's also like super, super subtle too. So I love using it in recipes like this because it is a very, very gentle form of heat uh, and works well in braises. braises. All right, last up, uh, I'm gonna get my wok going here again. Hmm. Fun new problem. Leave just crash. All right, anyway, uh, so uh, I've got my bok choy going in our wok. That's nice and fragrant. Uh, then we're gonna 